Good evening and welcome to Kini News. Do you remember reading some reports on how the government had revoked the license policy for restaurants and coffee shops to serve liquor? Well, it turns out that it wasn't actually revoked. Finance Minister Tunku Zafrul Aziz denied that the government revoked the liquor license measure for restaurants and coffee shops to sell alcohol. Tanku Zafro told the Dewan Raket today that the power to license or exempt retail premises from selling alcoholic drinks remains with the state. He explained that while licensing for the sale of alcoholic drinks fall under the jurisdiction of the licensing board, the authority had been delegated to the state's Menteri Basar or chief ministers through a government order in 1977. Uh, uh, seperti yang disebut oleh uh, Yang Berhormat Dangan Sara. Uh, seperti yang juga saya telah nyatakan tadi, uh, terdapat kekeliruan yang telah dimbul dalam pelaksanaan dan penguatkuasaan perkara ini di peringkat negeri. Uh, oleh itu, seperti yang saya nyatakan tadi, uh, saya telah mengarahkan Jabatan Kastam Diraja Malaysia untuk mengambil tindakan segera bagi memastikan kekeliruan ini tidak berulang uh, dan pelesenan penjualan minuman keras kekal Di bawah bidang kuasa lembaga pelesenan. He said this in response to Damansara MP Tony Pua who had asked a question on the issue. Earlier, it was reported that restaurants and coffee shops selling beer will be required to apply for a new license from the 1st of January as part of a new federal government policy. So the state government being able to decide on the licensing requirements may not be a good thing. This is according to DAP Secretary General Lim Guan Eng and here is why. DAP Secretary General Lim Guan Eng has called on the Ministry of Finance to postpone the enforcement on licensing of beer in coffee shops and restaurants instead of letting the state governments decide. He said the power on enforcement, which includes the penalty for selling liquor without a license, is under the purview of the Finance Ministry under the 1976 Excise Act and not under state laws. According to Lim, there were also risks with letting state governments decide, as there are some state governments that will be influenced by past policies to implement these new regulations on non-Muslim shops, which they had no powers to do so previously. He added that so far only the Harapan state governments have stated that they will not disrupt the current practice and will not require licensing of the sale of beer in restaurants and coffee shops. Lim questioned who will bear the responsibility for the additional costs and inconveniences faced by coffee shops and restaurants if state governments imposed the licensing requirement. He said the coffee shops and restaurants associations had previously expressed fears that 60% out of 15,000 restaurants and 80% out of 20,000 coffee shops nationwide may cease selling beer if the new regulations come to force. He said the regulations would affect the customary lifestyle and normal business practices of non-Muslims that have been in force since independence. Bersatu's Ali Biju, that's a little bit of a weird thing to say because he's contesting as an independent in the Sarawak elections. Well, he has withdrawn his candidacy now for the Korean state seat. Ali Biju has announced that he will withdraw his candidacy for the Korean state assembly seat and would back the GPS candidate instead. In a statement today, Ali said that if he did not withdraw it, it would have affected the relationship between Bersatu and Gabungan Party Sarawak. He added that he had been advised by the party leadership and given assurances by Bersatu President Muhyiddin Yassin on Perikata National's understanding with GPS. As the Sarartok MP, he had also urged his constituents, which encompasses the Kriyan, Kalaka and Kabong state constituencies, to back GPS. Although he has seized his campaign, his name will still appear on the ballot paper as the deadline to withdraw has lapsed. Ali, a two-term assembly person for Kriyan, had filed his nomination papers on Saturday to defend his seat as an independent. He is a member of Bersatu, which in turn is a component of the Perikata National Coalition. Both Bersatu and PN had previously announced that they would sit out of the Sarawak election. So while Ali Biju's withdrawal may come as a surprise to some folks, his move to contest as an independent has already caught it flex from some people, including the GPS chairperson. Gabungan Party Sarawak Chairperson Abang Johari Openg has expressed disappointment after Bersatu member Ali Biju decided to contest as an independent in the 12th Sarawak state election. In a press conference yesterday, the Sarawak chief minister said that it went against the promise that Bersatu had made of not contesting in the elections. Yeah, then Tan Sri Mudin did uh, make a press statement. He will take certain action against uh, uh, Ali Biju. He just wait. Eh? Are you disappointed that this is actually... Of course, I'm disappointed because there is a certain uh, agreement because he was telling me that uh, no Satu will come up in this election. Previously, it was reported that Bersatu had distanced itself from its member Ali Biju after he filed his nomination papers to contest for the Korean Legislative Assembly seat. Ali is seeking a third term as the Korean Assembly person. 
Bersatu Information Chief Wan Saiful Wan Jan, who did not name Ali, said that party rules do not allow members to run for public office without permission and disciplinary action can be taken, including expulsion. He added that the rules apply to Sarawak and the party will make an announcement soon. We're going to take a quick break for our sponsor and when we're back, find out why the issue of Taipuzum SOPs is back in the news today. We'll be right back. Shellfish, red meat, and beer. If you love indulging in these foods, you may end up with high uric acid level in your blood. These foods consist high level of purine, a substance that will eventually break down into uric acid and be excreted through our urine. It is recommended that the amount of dietary purines should be kept between 600 to 1000 mg per day. Having too much uric acid in your blood can cause attacks of gout. It can also cause kidney stones and blockage in the kidney. The crystallization of the excessive uric acid in your blood can be eased by reducing purine-rich food to only 100 to 150 mg daily, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, and consuming urinary alkalinizer like Ural. It consists of sodium bicarbonate, citric acid, and sodium citrate that increases the urinary pH and solubility of uric acid to prevent crystallization. Best of all, it's lemon flavored and sugar free. Ural, effective urinary alkalinizer. Neutralize your uric acid problem now. Welcome back! The National Unity Ministry has said that the Taipusam SOPs are not finalized yet right after the backlash that came over the announcement of its proposed SOPs by the minister. The National Unity Ministry has clarified that the COVID-19 standard operating procedures for the upcoming Taipusam celebrations have not been finalized yet. This came following backlash after its minister Halima Muhammad Sadiq told the Dewan Rakyat yesterday that the proposed SOPs would not allow the Taipusam chariot procession due to the threat of the Omicron variant. In a statement, the ministry said that the proposed SOP needs to be approved by the Pandemic Management Technical Working Group, the Ministerial Quartet, and the Pandemic Management Special Committee. They said the SOPs for the Taipusam celebrations will be announced by the National Unity Ministry upon approval from these committees. The ministry added that it had engagement sessions between 10 Hindu religious leaders from Selangor, Kuala Lumpur, Penang, Kedah, Perak and Johor and representatives from the National Security Council and Health Ministry. They had discussed procedures for seven different activities surrounding the celebrations, namely temple prayers, Kavadi processions, palkodam or milk offerings, hair shaving, ritual bathing, the opening of stalls, movement of the silver chariot and the accompanying procession. You know by now, price hikes on essential goods affect the public like you and me. But they also affect restaurant operators who use the same items, which is why eating out may cost more next year. The prices of food and drinks could increase next year due to the soaring costs of ingredients and goods. Restaurant operators said the price hikes would be inevitable as they cannot absorb the rising costs. The Malaysian Muslim Restaurant Owners Association or PRESMA, which represents 9,000 restaurants, said some have proposed a 10% price hike for menu items to cover a 30% increment in the cost of ingredients. Its president, Jawaha Ali Taib Khan, said they had been able to maintain prices for over three years and PRESMA is perhaps the only association that has asked its members not to raise their prices until the 30th of December. He said they would definitely impose an increment by next year but would try to minimize it and keep it at a reasonable rate. He stressed that this is not meant for the operators to make money but to cover rising costs. Besides costlier goods, Jawahar said the industry was also struggling with worker shortages, forcing employers to fork out higher wages to higher staff, which increases overhead costs. Meanwhile, the Malaysian Indian Restaurant Owners Association or PRIMAS believes that some of its 1,500 members have increased prices after the price of ingredients and goods they needed increased by 50 to 100 percent. PRIMAS Vice President C. Krishnan said that some of the restaurants increased their prices by 10 percent or 10 cent to 30 cent, which is unlikely to have a real impact on customers. He said customers understand as they purchase household goods too. He added that it is almost impossible for them to sustain their businesses without increasing the prices and they may need to increase prices by 15 to 20% to cover the rising costs. 
Krishnan also urged the government to understand the plight of the food service operators instead of just looking at the price tags charged to the customers. He said since March 2020, around 1,000 food outlets have closed shop as they could not sustain the cost of running a business. The proposal to revive the Kuala Lumpur Singapore High Speed Rail or HSR is still in the preliminary stages of discussion, which means that the price tag isn't finalized just yet. Minister in the Prime Minister's Department, Mustafa Mohammad, said that the proposal to revive the Kuala Lumpur Singapore High Speed Rail project is still in early discussions. He said this in response to Bagan MP Lim Guan Eng, who had asked about the revived project's costs and whether it could be reduced to 50 billion ringgit. I would like to say that the possibility to revive the project of KL Singapore is still in the first stage of the first stage. Oleh hal demikian, pertanyaan yang buat Bagan, sama ada kos projek boleh dikurangkan kepada RM50 billion tidak berbangkit. Last month, it was reported that Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob has proposed a revival of the HSR project in a bilateral meeting with Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long. The proposal came after Ismail Sabri's predecessor Muhyiddin Yassin terminated the project at a cost of 320 million ringgit. Singapore was reported to be open to fresh proposals from Malaysia on the project. And now we have a branded capsule brought to you by McDonald's Malaysia. McDonald's Malaysia and Ronald McDonald House Charities RMHC allocated 1.66 million ringgit to assist more than 21,000 underprivileged students nationwide through its significant back to school program. Sekolah Kebangsaan Felda Pasir Besar in Gemas Negeri Sembilan is among the first recipients this year to receive 200 back to school packs. Each pack includes a school bag, a water bottle, stationery, and a pair of school shoes. Yang mana anak-anak akan mendapat bantuan berjumlah dalam RM100 seorang uh, dengan beg sekolah, kartu sekolah, peralatan sekolah untuk mereka uh, ke sekolah dengan sempurna. Since 2017, as part of Corporate Social Responsibility Initiatives, McDonald's Malaysia and RMHC have been actively donating back-to-school packs to primary school students from low-income households to upkeep the children's motivation in excelling their studies. Jadi setiap tahun dalam 25 ke 30,000 pack dan donation untuk pack ini datang daripada pelanggan-pelanggan kita yang mana mereka boleh masukkan duit dalam tabung-tabung ataupun dalam SOK itu bantuan RMAC dan juga daripada corporate-corporate uh, supplier McDonald's sendiri dan individu. As of 2021, nearly 9 million ringgit has been contributed to the back to school program which has positively impacted the lives of more than 95,000 children nationwide. Uh, InsyaAllah, aktiviti-aktiviti uh, kita panggil grassroots ataupun corporate social responsibility ini akan berterusan sebab VC McDonald's ialah untuk membantu masyarakat bukan saja untuk memberi makanan yang sempurna dan berkualiti tapi juga untuk membantu masyarakat di mana kita berniaga Well, that's a wrap for Kini News this evening. For more stories, go to kinetv.com. Don't forget to follow us on our social media on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook to get the latest news headlines. If you'd like to support the independent media, do consider a subscription to malaysiakini.com. When you're heading out, don't forget that mask. And when you can, please try to stay home. I'm Daniel Anthony. Thank you for watching. And as always, stay safe, Malaysia. Everyone wants to see these scenes bigger. That's why we've got bigger TVs for everyone to enjoy them bigger. Watch colors come to life on a large screen. LG Nanocell.